Hi, everybody. It's good to connect with you once, once again. And today is a day that it is post-election. The votes are all in and Joe Biden will be the next president, the 46th president of the United States and Kamala Harris will be the vice president of the United States. That is historically significant as Margaret O'Meara has pointed out. And it's also all the more important that you'll hear from Alexis Harris now after the election. What I want you to listen for with, with Alexis in her lecture and, and in my discussion with her, there are several things. Where she's from is actually significant. She's from our neighborhood. She's from right in Seattle. She's from the south side of, of Seattle, what she's gonna call the central district. She grew up here and she, as she describes it, quote, bleeds purple. So she's from a local high school. She went to the local university and went off and did her PhD at UCLA and then came back to the university. So think about where she came from and think about where she is now. Think about what she's doing now that she is where she is now. She's a scholar. She teaches students at all three of our campuses, but she also teaches out in the community. And it's important for you to listen to how she does her work, where she's from, where she is now, and how she's doing her work now. And the kind of impact that she's having is also all the more important. I have a couple of questions for you to think about. And so as you watch her talk, there are a couple of big concepts because sociologists deal with really big concepts. One is this concept of mass incarceration. What is mass incarceration? And how did that come to be? It's a problem around the world perhaps, but it's a particular problem in the United States. A second thing I want you to think about, and the second question I want you to consider, is she quotes James Baldwin in saying, it is expensive to be poor. What does she mean by that? Because she addresses that in her talk. It's expensive to be poor. So I want you to write about and talk about and think about that concept, those two concepts. What is mass incarceration? What does that mean? And why is it expensive to be poor in the United States? So thank you for listening. Pay close attention to, to Dr. Harris's talk and, and think about where she comes from and what she's doing now. She's been an important scholar for us. Hi, I'm Alexis Harris. I'm a professor in the Department of Sociology and I am going to be uh, spending the next few minutes talking about what I teach and my research um, and the things I love to do as a professor. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you all right now. There we go. So I am Alexis Harris. I'm a professor here in the Department of Sociology. I've been a professor since 2004 uh, here in the Sociology Department. I'm just gonna, gonna put that up there. Uh, I teach uh, generally social 270 social problems and that's usually a lecture to about 300 students in person. Right now I'm doing it on Zoom and we're doing 200 on Zoom. Um, and in that class, we talk about social problems. We uh, introduce you to a set of theoretical framings or lenses that you can think through critically social problems in different ways. Um, and in the buckets of social problems we talk about are juvenile and criminal justice, uh, poverty and inequality, and HIV AIDS. Um, and then I also teach a, a, a 362 level course, uh, race and ethnicity in the United States. And in that course, we really engage with issues related to race and, and ethnicity in the United States. Um, I firmly believe that we can't talk about contemporary issues related to racism, uh, racial disparities without really understanding our history. So at the beginning of that class, we talk about what I call these four key pivotal moments in U.S. Uh, history from um, the colonization of the Native Americans in this country uh, to the enslavement of people from Africa to the internment of Japanese Americans living in this country and then the changing borders with Mexico and the pull and push uh, around immigration and who has been considered a citizen in this country and then we go through different what I said call construction sites of how race is made and changed in different ways throughout US history. So those, those courses are always timely and relevant given contemporary social issues and, and discourse. And so I find those a lot of fun for me to engage in and I'm constantly learning from students and also from um, updated research in these areas. Uh, in general, I call myself a, a scholar of social stratification and inequality. So I'm really interested, particularly in how 
how institutions matter in creating and predicting individuals' life chances. So if we think about educational systems, financial systems, the juvenile and criminal justice system, which I study, how does contact with any of these institutions shape the outcomes for individuals? And how might that differ depending upon the race and ethnicity, the class background, even the gender uh, of individuals? I have been primarily trained as an ethnographer, a qualitative researcher. So I do interviews with people. Um, my research has focused on our juvenile and criminal legal systems. So I do a lot of court ethnographies where I go and sit in the courtroom and make observations of interactions between judges, defense attorneys, uh, and prosecutors and the person who's brought before the, the court. Um, my earlier work uh, for my dissertation focused on the juvenile uh, justice system and specifically the transfer of minors from the juvenile system to the adult criminal legal system. I've also studied sub prime lending markets. These are non-traditional uh, economic markets where frequently disproportionately people who of color and poor people find themselves locked into these really expensive um, markets. And then most recently for like, well, the past 13 years, um, I focused on something called uh, legal financial obligations in the adult criminal system. And I'm going to talk about that in, in a few slides. So really I'm interested in institutional processing sort of the assessments and labeling. Once somebody enters a system like the criminal legal system, how are they labeled? How are characterizations made about them? What is their file? How's that being built? And how does that affect their processing and then the outcomes? What are the consequences for people who have been tagged as a felon or a misdemeanor in our criminal legal system? What are the consequences once they try and return back to their lives? So I'm really interested in what's called law in action. Um, I think in law school and in general, many people think that uh, the law is black and white, but we really have to understand it as it constantly being applied and interpreted by decision makers, judges and prosecutors and defense attorneys. And so I'm interested in how, how law is enacted and how it differs depending upon different types of jurisdictions. And I'm also interested in the intersection between culture and structure. So culture of courthouses, uh, culture of communities, how does that impact institutional engagement? So that's sort of my research and my teaching in a nutshell. I'm gonna jump into something that I, I talk a lot about, I teach a lot about as our uh, United States criminal legal system. And in particular, uh, my work has focused on mass conviction and incarceration. And this is it, this is the definition of mass incarceration. Since about 1974, we've had a dramatic increase in the numbers of people who live behind bars, about 500% increase. So this is a summary of some statistics that I'll share with you. So incarceration has increased by 500% in the last 40 years. One in 115 adults were in jail or prison in 2015. 2.2 2 million people are in jail or prison. Um, 4.6 million people are on probation or parole. So that means we have just under 7 million people who are in some form of supervision in this country. Um, one in 91 white men, uh, age 30 to 34, have been to prison, one in 42 Latino men, and one in 17 black men. And so that's disproportionality. That's, um, we can say that men of color are disproportionately incarcerated to com compared to their counterpart white men. Um, one in 17 black men, if you can think about how dramatic that is, not just for individuals, but for families um, and entire communities. Um, and this type of racial disparity is the same also for women. We can see that the rate of incarceration for black women is two times that of white women, Latina women 1.2 uh, that of white women. Um, Sarah Shannon is a criminologist and she and colleagues did estimates on data uh, in 2010, 2010 data and found that um, approximately 3% of the adult population, male population has been to jail. So 3%, three out of 100 
men in this country have been to prison, but 15% of the African-American adult male population has been to prison, 15%. Um, They've also estimated that about 8% of the adult male population has a felony conviction, but 33% of African-American adult male population has a felony conviction. So that's one out of every three in in a young uh, black man is estimated to have a felony conviction in the United States. I think oftentimes in your high school classes, even college classes, we learn that the United States is exceptional uh, compared to the rest of the world. And this is clear that the United States is exceptional in terms of how we choose to incarcerate um, and punish people in this country, but also in terms of the disproportionate way in which we put people of color behind bars and on some form of state supervision. Um, And recent scholarship just last year, um, folks who had been affiliated with the University of Washington, both Edwards and Esposito, received their PhDs in the sociology department here. They calculated the lifetime risk of being killed by a police officer. So if you can imagine that, you're born on one day and you can have a risk associated with you depending upon either your gender or your race and ethnicity. And they found that women have a one in 33,000 lifetime risk of being murdered by a police officer. Men a one in 2000 lifetime risk, but black men have a one in 1000 risk, lifetime risk of being killed by a police officer. So they conclude that particularly for younger black men, being killed by a police officer is one of the leading causes of death. Okay, one of the leading causes of death for young black men in the United States is to be killed by a police officer. So we have this profound Uh, system of race and class disparities uh, infused in our contemporary criminal legal system. And that's why many people in this moment are calling for a dismantling or a revisioning of how our justice system is is run. Okay, so what I study, um, I study something called monetary sanctions. These are the fines, fees, restitutions, costs, surcharge, interest that people are charged when they encounter a criminal legal system. So this is all from uh, traffic citations, if you're speeding, all the way up to felony convictions, more severe types of offenses. In Wash, every state has a some form of a system of monetary sanctions. Um, so for example, in Washington state, there is a mandatory victim penalty assessment, a VPA. So if anyone that's charged and convicted of a felony in Washington state receives a $500 charge just off the bat. And then if a misdemeanor, it's a $250 um, bill that they receive. There's also a mandatory uh, DNA collection fee at $100. And then there are a host of optional or what they call discretionary types of of costs that are imposed to individuals. So in Washington, there's a $200 court cost. There's costs related to um, having a warrant issued. There is a cost for what's called the Department of Assigned Counsel, and that's your defense attorney. Right. So in the movies you, you see, you have the right to attorney. Um, if you cannot afford one, one will be appointed to you. But the Supreme Court decisions that mandated that attorney be appointed n- never outlined who was going to pay for that defense attorney. So increasingly over the last 20 years, states are now charging individuals uh, for that cost of a public defender. So for example, in Pierce County, which is just to the south of King County, where the University of Washington is, uh, you'll be charged $450 for the use of a public defender. There's also a fee for requesting a jury trial, right? To exercise fully your right, you're charged for that. So $125 is a discount, $125 for a six person jury, $250 for a 12 person jury. Um, And then in Washington, like many other states, you can also be charged for the cost of your incarceration. So in Washington, you can be charged up to $100 per day in jail or $50 per day in uh, prison. On top of that, uh, there are fees. Uh, so there's 12% interest on restitution in Washington state and interest on everything else if you're incarcerated until you get out. There's a $100 annual collection surcharge. So if you have an open account, uh, if you have multiple tickets, multiple felony or misdemeanor, each um, account is charged $100 annually until you pay it off, uh, the $100 DNA collection fee. And then there's also per payment fees. 
So if I go online to pay my ticket or pay my, my monetary sanction related to a felony, I'm charged each time I make a payment. So and one of my favorite um, authors is James Baldwin. And he had a quote that it's expensive to be poor. Um, and this truly shows that if you're poor and you can't pay all of your fines and fees off when you encounter our systems of justice, it'll cost you extra money. Um, and it's a very different experience for people who are poor, who encounter our criminal legal system. Mind you, these costs are given to people even when they go to jail, right? Even when you spend jail time or you go to prison, people usually get um, incarceration time. They get community service uh, they get uh, community supervision, probation. Uh, sometimes you'll have classes that you have to attend. And in addition to all of that punishment, you get the monetary sanctions as well. So I wrote a book called A Pound of Flesh in 2016, Monetary Sanctions as a Punishment for the Poor. And I conclude that, you know, as we saw with the mass conviction and incarceration and this expansion of our criminal legal system, um, that we have a very distinct population that makes contact, particularly with the serious level offenses. Um, they tend to be disadvantaged pre and post conviction. So a large percentage of the people who make contact with our criminal legal system have mental health issues, uh, substance abuse, maybe addiction to alcohol or drugs, tend to be uh, impoverished and ha have lower levels of formal education. So this population is distinct than any other population in the United States, that they are disadvantaged. Um, and even post-incarceration, they have a slew of what uh, sociologists and criminologists call uh, collateral consequences. So it's a distinct population. I argue that this process of monetary sanctions perfectly labels, it stigmatizes, and it financially burdens and imposes further legal consequences to people who are poor. Until you can pay off all of your fines and fees, you are not a full citizen. You don't, in many states, have a right to vote. We just have seen this in um, in, with, in Florida with Amendment 4, that until over uh, close to a million people have lost their right to vote because they have not been able to pay off their legal financial obligations. But if you're wealthier, you have means, you commit the exact same crime, you do the exact same punishment and time in jail, but you pay your fines and fees, and then you can move forward and regain your right to vote. I argue that this process also perfectly sorts the already marginalized and further cements them to lives of inequality. So it's this perfect Dr. Evil type scenario um, where people receive a con conviction. Many times they're already poor and disadvantaged and they come out even more disadvantaged. I've just an analysis with some um, colleagues uh, for a peer reviewed publication. And we find that this isn't just an individual problem but we can measure this at the community level. So disproportionately, poor neighborhoods and neighborhoods with higher rates of non-white people living in those communities, so communities of color, are burdened with this um, debt and carry it on and it perpetuates poverty in their neighborhoods. And the consequence is that it allows perpetual state uh, surveillance, intervention, and control of poor felons, a very different experience of punishment than if you were wealthy um, and a longer, right? That's why I call it a, a pun. I wanted to call it a permanent punishment, but my um, publisher wouldn't allow me to have that many words in my title, but I really wanted it to be called a permanent punishment for the poor. So it's a very different experience that people experience uh, for, of justice that poor people have compared to wealthier people. I just want to sort of say one thing I'm, I'm just ending now is a, an eight state study. We did it over five years. It was a $4 million budget sponsored by Arnold, Arnold Ventures, and it was a multi-state study of monetary sanctions. So it was really replicating what I did in my book in eight states. So we are in Washington, California, Texas, Missouri, Minnesota, Georgia, New York, and Illinois. Um, we looked at uh, municipal courts and superior courts. We did observations of sentencing hearings and sanctioning hearings over 200 hours per each site. We had over 954 interviews and surveys with people who owed debt, but also with prosecutors, judges, defense attorneys, clerks, and probation officers to really understand how these systems of monetary sanctions worked uh, across our eight states and within our eight states. Um, and we also, not in every state because of data access problems, but we tried to compile a multi-year 
set of core automated data for statistical analysis, um, including data on fines and fees. So for example, in Washington state, we have data from 2000 to 2014 of all um, citation violations and criminal violations from traffic citations all the way up to a uh, felony conviction with the fines and fee amount uh, that was sentenced. And at the date that we pulled the data, we have the amount that people were able to pay. So this allows us to do statistical analysis to look at the legal and social characteristics of individual cases and to see if there are differences in sentencing amounts. Um, so this is my, the, my big study and I will be publishing and doing analyses for years to come from this. For example, this is a summary paper that we did recently and we found across our eight states that the process uh, of punishment is not transparent, that, it's, that people have a lot of confusion about the way that it works. It varies widely by type of court and jurisdictions from urban to rural courts, that noncompliance can result in large total financial obligations and extra legal consequences for individuals. So in many jurisdictions, if people fail, fail to make payment, then they can go to jail for up to 60 days for non-payment. State's data collection and court actors participation varies uh, substantially in our um, analysis. Um, some people just didn't want to talk to us and many states just didn't have the data that we are seeking. In terms of policy implications, we argue that there should be a standard definition of indigence, ability to pay assessment processes and full waivers of all costs for people who are poor. Uh, if you're homeless, if you're unemployed, if you're, you have mental health issues, um, we argue that it does not seem to further the purpose of justice in this country by saddling people with debt and debt that increases because of extra costs and interest. We suggest that we should remove additional sanctions for pay, failure to pay people when common practice is that people lose the, their driver's licenses. Um, and we argue that that's counterproductive, that people need their driver's licenses to get to the job, to earn the check, to pay the fines and fees. Um, we also argue that um, courts should expand their tra transparency and access. In some states, people don't even know how much they owe and courts can't tell them. Um, and then we definitely uh, suggest that courts develop and maintain accessible data and access uh, to their procedures and how this is, is, is happening. It's a little known practice, but it has dramatic consequences nationally. So a summary is really um, from my work over the past 13 years on this topic, I found that the system of monetary sanctions really invades all of the areas of sociology that many of my colleagues and peers study. We can talk about violence, we can talk about health, education, voting and the loss of the right to vote, the loss of driver's licenses, the family, um, the stress in, on relationships and the inability of individuals to actually support their families because of this debt. It affects housing, it affects employment opportunities, it affects the wealth attainment process, it extends criminal justice supervision, it, it um, interrupts your credit as well. So it's a, in sum, a two-tiered system of justice where it clearly is an example of where an institution creates stratification. It, um, it generates poverty and it uh, amplifies poverty that people are experiencing. Um, I just actually I want to note that one of the neat things that I get to do as a sociologist and someone who engages in work on in the criminal legal system is engage in policy and really try to advocate for change based on my empirical analyses and the implications from my research. So there's a lot of different ways that academics can engage if we choose in the real world. Um, one is through media, doing interviews uh, for you know television interviews or for print um, to help shape the issue and uh, educate general um, the general public on these issues. I've also had an opportunity to write uh, op-eds on the topic of my research. Um, engaging with policymakers. I had a really, really neat opportunity in 2015 to speak at the White House and engage in a Department of Justice convening and, tes and testify. Um, I testified before the US Commission on Civil Rights, the Washington State Legislature about new um, policy, the Washington State Superior Court about racial disparities in Washington State, and even the, recently the Seattle Municipal Court about the practices around fines and fees related to traffic citations and misdemeanors. I've also gotten to work with practitioners and do what's called CLEs, uh, continuing, continuing legal education for judges and, and um, attorneys in the state. Um, and have had the opportunity to speak at national and state conferences as well. 
And then some of the other really interesting work to work with people across the, the nation is um, one is the Washington State Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. I'm currently the chair. And we get to, to examine issues where that we believe are important in Washington State where um, so people's civil rights might be violated. So recently we did a, a project around felon voter disenfranchisement and the right to vote in Washington. Um, I was also appointed by the, uh, to the National Task Force on Fines and Fees and Bail Practices and worked with um, judges from across um, the U.S. around the issue of fines and fees. Um, in Washington State, we have a race and criminal justice task force um, with all three of the law schools. So University of Washington Law School, Seattle University Law School, and, and Gonzaga Law School. And so I get to work with the leadership on that task force to help update information on racial disparities in Washington State and also develop policy implications and advocate for change where I think it's needed. Uh, I was appointed to the Office of Justice Programs to the US Science Advisory Board. Um, several years ago, um, and I am a board member for what's called the Fines and Fees Justice Center. So I get to work uh, from this perch, this really neat uh, perch uh, with uh, people across the nation and trying to understand what our criminal legal system is doing, um, how it affects people, how it disproportionately affects people, particularly people of color and people who are poor in this country. And then I get to advocate for real change. And so I hope you've enjoyed learning a bit about me. Um, I should have said at the beginning, welcome to the University of Washington. Um, but uh, I, I hope I get to see you in my classes and engage with you moving forward. Thank you for watching. Take care. Hi, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to, um, to provide a little introduction to Alexis Harris and to have a discussion with, with Dr. Alexis Harris. And you'll see from, from her bio that she is a, a scholar, a public scholar, and an author, and has done remarkable work. What you may not see, and Alexis, I'm going to start by asking you, there's another part of your work that, that people may not see in your bio, is that you've been something called a faculty athletic rep. And in a world in elite universities where sometimes the general university is seen over here and big time athletics is seen as being over someplace else. Um, here, you straddle both of those fences. You stand up for all of our students. Talk about your role as a, as a faculty athletic rep in addition to being a scholar. Sure. So uh, just over a year now, I was appointed by President Kause to be the faculty athletic rep or the FAR. Um, and it's a, an exciting role where I get to work with our student athletes on campus um, and our staff in uh, the athletic department, sort of three different things, uh, responsibilities that I have. One is to uh, address issues around compliance. So I learned a lot about the legislation, NCA legislation and guidelines. Um, I learned a lot about waivers and transfers and help facilitate students in those types of positions. Um, so that's one thing. And the other is I help represent the University of Washington to the Pac-12 along with President Kause, our athletic director and our senior women's advisor along with our two uh, student representatives. And then the, the biggest reason why I'm so excited to be in this position is to really focus on issues of health and well-being of our student athletes. And so I get to talk with our student athletes around about different issues like voting recently, um, facilitate any issues they may have on upper campus with professors or accessing classes or uh, if they travel on the road, things like that. So it's, it's a really fun, different way to be a faculty member on campus and really ensure that all of our student athletes are getting the education they deserve and the education that they want and trying to sort of smooth any rough patches that they may experience along the way. Good. You do so much. And the point is you stand up for so many of our students, no matter where they come from, no matter how they get to the university. So Dr. Harris, I really, really appreciated your, your talk. Before we get to your talk, which is so important and so relevant to the theme of this course, which is 2020, so much of your talk actually really speaks to, to 2020. Um, I want to ask you about just you. And, and here's something that, that you've said to me often, and you've said it publicly often, that you, you bleed purple. Now, I know what that means, but students who may not know you, who may not have had your class or followed your bio, um, what does it mean for you to, to bleed purple? And that goes back to the young Alexis Harris as a Garfield bulldog. Talk about how you got from, from where you were as, as a 15 or 16-year-old to where you are now. 
Yeah, so I, I bleed purple. I'm proud of it. I am born and raised in Seattle, uh, in the close to uh, the Central District in Madrona, um, and went attended Garfield High School and graduated from there. Um, and so that you know, purple and white for Garfield High School for folks who aren't familiar with this area. So that's sort of the the foundation of being sort of purple. Um, but really, while I was at Garfield as a bulldog, I uh, I learned so much about. Uh, community organizing, about youth empowerment issues, about poverty and inequality and social justice um, through different interactions with people who were committed to Garfield students. And so that really set the foundation for me to move on and, and be a first generation student at the University of Washington and have the audacity to believe that I could be successful and actually go on to graduate school. So the University of Washington continued to help shape my academic career and really fuel my, my passions around social justice. Um, I had some amazing professors my first year, uh, Al Black, Bob Crutchfield, uh, Janella Butler, who really shaped um, sort of my life course trajectory. I didn't really know much being a first gen student about college or degrees and um, meeting them and learning from them and being inspired about actually studying issues related to um, poverty, inequality, crime and justice and really um, having that foundational support that I believe that I could be successful in academia and moving on. So I that excitement and passion and insight that was really fostered in me and supported in me as an undergrad um, gave me a strong, firm commitment to support our students here at the University of Washington. Uh, I went away to UCLA for grad school and fortunately came back um, as a professor. And so, yeah, that's why I bleed purple. I, because I also love athletics and the sports on the field. Um, but for me, it's also about the intellectual uh, development of our students and helping them find their passions, whatever it might be. So you studied with Janella Butler and with Bob Crutchfield and, and Al Black. Did you know what a sociologist was when you came to school? Oh. Did you know that you wanted to be a sociologist? No, I've often said that I had, again, I, I literally did not know the degree I was getting. I just knew the importance of college. And so um, I had my role model was Claire Huxtable and our students might not know who she was, but she was, Claire Huxtable was. <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the Cosby show. And she was a, a black woman who was a strong woman and an attorney and a mom and a partner. And that's who I wanted to be. So I actually went to UW thinking I had to major in poli sci so I could go to law school. Um, and I hated my poli sci class. It wasn't because of the professor, it just wasn't for me. Um, and so I happened to take a class with uh, Al Black and that is what sort of inspired me to say I could study the law. It wouldn't necessarily have to be in it, but I could study it and then, you know, naively to some degree, I still believe it, create research that could inform policymakers to make smarter, better decisions about supporting people who are poor and marginalized. You mentioned uh, Claire Huxtable being an attorney and a mom and a partner. I want to ask you a question about that and you know what's coming, but I want to ask you something that I saw on, on a Twitter feed of yours that you said your superhero powers are fighting injustice and fighting cancer. Talk about those two things that you choose to fight. Yeah, so from Garfield all the way up, I was always interested in youth empowerment issues and I saw people being arrested who looked like me, who looked like my my now husband and my father and my brother, black men. Um, and I saw people being killed as well. And so I knew I wanted a career to somehow understand why this was happening um, and to make a difference. I always say I never had the privilege to sit on the sidelines and produce scholarship that didn't matter in the real world. And so that's why I choose to engage. Um, I've had an amazing career up into 2016 um, in a very, very humble way. I, I even had the opportunity to speak at the White House and the Department of Justice, Obama's Department of Justice in 2015. So I had an amazing career and my book was being released in June 9th, 2016. But on May 26, 2016, I was diagnosed with cancer, um, a rare form of blood cancer. Um, and it was a tough battle for a year and I learned a great deal from it. Um, and I had a stem cell transplant and my life was saved. Actually, another reason why I literally bleed purple, my life was saved by University of Washington 
medical school in Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Um, so I have, my son was five at the time, my daughter was nine and they're older, but we love superhero movies. And so when I first opened my Twitter account, I said, what are my, my son said, what are your superheroes? Where I talk about that. And one of my, my superhero um, abilities is to uh, fight cancer. Um, and I'm keeping fighting every day. Uh, both for myself and for the people I love and, and in this in this world to try and raise awareness around particularly the bone marrow transplant registry. You took a little bit of time to fight cancer and, and what a fight that, that you had. And you came back and I believe the year you came back, you won something called the Distinguished Teaching Award, Dr. Harris, which is one of our, which is one of our honors that a handful of people get and they're really for our exceptional faculty. What was that like to win the Distinguished Teaching Award? And don't be modest now because, <laughs> because this was a rigorous process where a handful of people get selected. What was yeah. that like to come back the year that you had returned? Oh, you know, Ed, that's gonna make me cry thinking about that. Um, it meant a great deal. Um, I was teaching spring quarter um, when I was diagnosed with cancer. And um, I remember at the last day of class, it was a small class of actually honor students. And I remember thinking, okay, is this going to be the last class I ever teach? And that was super, super hard. And I had an amazing young student come up after me, after to me afterwards. And, uh, you know, just talked about how important it was for him to have a person of color teach a class and um, really talk about structural inequalities. And um, so that hit even hard, I, harder. I started to cry, I didn't tell him why. But um, so then coming back the year later and being recognized for my teaching, um, and I think in part just being recognized also for being a person of color who can who's willing and open to show our students that we matter, that I see them in the classroom, that I see first gen students and I wanna, I'm not embarrassed about being first gen. I'm not embarrassed about my struggles with writing, um, that I'm open. I think that's what the students responded to um, and, and why they wanted to give me that, that nice honor. Uh, it meant the world to me. The, um, I think the, the biggest uh, recognition I could ever have in my career. Today's November 9th, and yesterday, November 8th, was National First Generation Day. And you've acknowledged and recognized all those students that are now first generation and are first generation students to, to come. And, and what a powerful thing, because I was in the room when you won your Distinguished, distinguished Teaching Award, and I was sitting in the back of the room, and I saw your, your picture and your face up on the screen. And, and I was of the many people applauding your, your accomplishment. So speaking of inspiration, uh, when you when you did your talk and uploaded it for our students, um, it was a week or two ago. And over the weekend, uh, Joe Biden was elected the incumbent president, the incoming president of the United States, 46th president of the United States. And Kamala Harris will be the vice president of the United States and will enter the, the White House. And, and we know some things about her. Um, her mother is Indian American, her father Jamaican, and she has a partner, she's a lawyer, she's a senator. And so what did, what did seeing Kamala Harris standing up on the stage this weekend, what did that mean for you? I, I think, you know, it literally didn't hit me until she walked up onto the stage, uh, walking into Mary J. Blige, thriving song. Um, that was just perfect. Um, I think uh, just, I think for me, in part, I feel like a little bit, I understand the struggles that she's faced and how much she had to push. And so it just felt so darn good to have someone who looked like me stand up there and, you know, accept this, this humongous role. Um, because so many of us, women of color in particular, are marginalized and face the microaggressions daily that have to suit up to protect ourselves. So just seeing that, but besides that, it was watching my 13 year old daughter watch her. And that was even bigger because my daughter can see a woman that looks like her in a powerful place. Um, and my daughter can, won't have to think of that, about those barriers so much. We still have to face these barriers every day, but at least she can see herself up there. Just like my son 
saw Barack Obama. Um, I think it's important for all of us, uh, regardless of our, 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 our racial and ethnic backgrounds and uh, gender orientations to see women of color in positions like that. And so it was just, it was a neat, it was a really neat night. It was neat to see universities like Howard University be acknowledged and honored as well, was it not? Well, yes, and also being a member of Divine Nine, a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, not uh, uh, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris's uh, sorority, but to see the the Black Letter, Greek Letter organizations represented was also amazing. It felt like there was a, you know, one of my own sisters, like literally in many different ways was on stage. And so that just felt amazing. So 2020 is historic for, for that reason it, itself. Let me get to some of what you talked about in your, in your lecture, um, Alexis. These are things that you've, you've been teaching about and talking about and writing about for so many years, and they remain equally powerful. Um, you're a scholar of, of social stratification and, and inequality, and you make the case during the course of your, of your talk, correct me if I'm wrong, that so much of the inequality that we face in, in our country right now comes as a result of laws that we've created and policies that we've, we've created, that these aren't natural phenomena, that we've created some of these inequalities. So Dr. Harris, how do you as a scholar of social stratification and inequality and, and your fight to undo forms of inequality reconcile the fact that so many of these inequalities are a result of policies and laws that we ourselves have created. How do you reconcile that tension? Uh, that's a lot. I mean, I think that, so, so I'm a sociologist and I, so I study society, but I also, so I study in uh, specifically the application of the law and how judges interpret, apply the law and how that then disproportionately impacts different types of groups being processed within our criminal legal system. But I think, you know, that's sort of my focus, but I think it's also important to understand the historical context. And that's both the way that I teach and uh, the context from which I do research. So we, we need to understand that what we're experiencing today and, you know, whatever we talk about, health disparities, disproportionate confinement and supervision of people of color in our criminal legal system, um, educational disparities, whatever we talk about is not new. Um, and it's important to remember the history from which our current circumstances are born and that it's both policies that are embedded in our structural systems, but also a culture, right? A culture that is steeped in racism. Um, and so the laws that are created, the cracks and crevices within all of our institutions are in some way connected to that racism, that, that structural racism. And so I think that gives a broader analysis for me to understand. So when we talk about the criminal legal system, we have to go back all the way to history and talk about enslavement of um, people who were stolen from Africa. We have to talk about colonization of native, native people. Um, we have to move through history and see how different groups were racialized and marginalized from Japanese internment to Jap the internment of Japanese Americans in this country the changing borders with um, Mexico for labor and social control. These are all common themes that have evolved through history, but today current practices are very much the same. So enslavement to um, slave leasing, to convict leasing, to Jim Crow, um, uh, black codes, um, all of these practices were in some iteration or form to socially control, marginalize and extract wealth from individuals. So that gives me, so that historical context really gives me a broader understanding to understand why we still have these, these laws. Yeah, let's go further into understanding this. You point out that um, mass incar incarceration, that our prison population has increased 500% in the last 40 years, 500% in the last 40 years, 2.2 million people in jail or in prison, 4.6 million people on probation or, per pol per or parole, 6.7 people under some kind of supervision in the United States. That's in the last 40 years, which means that's not a Democratic or Republican issue because we've had presidents from across the aisles. How do we reconcile and understand that kind of, of decision to increase the, the, the prison, the, to create a form of mass in, incarceration? Mm -hmm. How do we understand that and reconcile that? 
Yeah, and it's also always important to note, and I said this when I spoke at the White House, that you know, in these rooms, people always say that the United States is exceptional, right? Um, but we are exceptional in the way in which we put people behind bars and we control and marginalize them. Um, and again, it's part and parcel of that history, right? It's contemporary iteration of controlling bodies, marking them with felonies, sentencing them to what I, I study, monetary sanctions, fines and fees. Um, and it really penalizes and punishes a special group of people. These folks are disproportionately under formally educated, disproportionately poor, uh, disproportionate higher rates of mental health uh, problems, of drug and alcohol addiction, of unemployment. And we funnel them through a system instead of providing them with services, housing, employment training, job opportunity, uh, drug treatment, uh, health care. Right? Instead, we choose as a society to incarcerate them and then saddle them with legal debt um, and marginalize them. They can't, many people cannot uh, regain their right to vote until they've paid off their fines and fees. So, you know, I write in, in my book that um, the system of monetary sanctions is a contemporary iteration of social control. We've always had some form from enslavement until today. Um, that marginalize, and I, you know, I, I say, you know, that if I were Dr. Evil and tasked with devising the perfect system of stratification, the system of monetary sanctions is that it perfectly sorts and marginalizes an already um, marginalized population, uh, saddles them with a felony, a debt, further legal consequences, and and keeps them separate from the rest of society. And we do this on purpose. These are choices that politicians, policymakers, and citizens, because it's done in our name, right? These are choices that we all make as a society on how we want to treat people who have, um, who we've, we failed, essentially. One of the markers of 2020, it calls into public the risk associated for African-American men to be killed by, by police officers. And that was brought home by much of the world during COVID-19, which impacted the world, and the world having access to a video of, of George Floyd being, being killed mm -hmm. by, by an officer. And you provide some data about the likelihood of black men being killed by police officers. And there's a public safety debate happening right now in the United States and one that we need to have. Having witnessed this, Alexis, and I know that you did and so did, so did I, and we've both been impacted by this, but do you think that this will be a turning point for, for this country? George Floyd's, I, death, George Floyd's death, will it be a turning point in our country? I hope so. I mean, I think it already has been uh, where we're having conversations uh, in wherever, in, amongst our neighborhood group, our friendship groups, in our workplaces. Um, and so I, I think it people are, are starting to be willing to engage. They saw such a stark horror with a black man being killed um, in eight minutes um, and no one stopped it. Um, that they many people can't but recognize racism in this country and the problems with our criminal legal system. So on one end, we're having conversations. The other end, we need real structural change. And folks are calling from that, from even the local Seattle city uh, government, council government, all the way up to um, uh, Congress, having conversations about bills on how to do this. I think the key thing is, is to dismantle and shrink the footprint of our criminal legal system. At the same time, we have to build up those systems of support for housing. Um, you know, the top three uh, mental health facilities in this country are jails. Cook County, LA County, the, the, our jails are our largest serving institutions for people with mental health issues. So we need to shrink the criminal legal system and, and criminalizing everything, but then figure out ways of support to really change the lives of individuals so that they can leave, uh, live healthy and successful lives. And it makes our society safer as well. But I, I do, I do see conversations. I've been participating in conversations. Um, I don't think we're going to let this one, um, Lie down. I think we are going to keep on fighting for real change until we get it. It's important that you had noted here, um, Dr. Harris, the um, that some of this is is how we treat and and respect those who are mentally ill, 
such a powerful statement. You also have some things to say because you quote James Baldwin in, in saying that it's expensive to be poor and your book, A, a Pound of Flesh, and congratulations on your, on your book, by the way, it came out in 2016. It's been such an important, impactful book, but illustrates how, how expensive it is to be poor, which is such a paradoxical kind of thing to say. Explain what that means. It's expensive to be poor in this country. Literally, when you're poor in this society, things cost more. Um, your taxes in Washington state are more because it's a regressive tax, right? So you pay taxes, sales tax instead of income tax. So you're actually paying more tax comparatively uh, related to your income than someone, say, Bill Gates across the water. Um, so, you know, from I'm working with two collaborators now, one is studying um, higher ed debt. Right. And people who are poor pay more because they pay interest more for longer periods of time. Um, another collaborator is studying uh, fringe credit markets, so payday lending pawn shops. So, again, people who are poor pay more through financing credit uh, in those realms because they're locked out of traditional banks. And then with monetary sanctions, people pay more when you're poor. You have two lines, a two tiered system of justice. Um, you know, I commit I, even a traffic ticket, you know, moving violation. Um, I can pay that fee um, and kind of wash my hands and move forward. But if someone can't pay a hundred, two hundred dollar uh, traffic citation, then you'll start paying on that. You'll pay collection fees and in some places interest. So again, it's it's expensive to be poor because you can't pay it off right away. You're going to end up paying more. So it's a very clear example of a two-tiered system of justice. Um, the punishment is much longer for pe poor people, the duration is longer, and then the intensity is longer because you're under that constant burden of debt to the state. So truly in this society, it's expensive to be poor. Your language here is so powerful um, because you, you say, and you, you say it in a pound of flesh and you say it in your talk, that this is a process that perfectly sorts the already marginalized perfectly sorts them, use the word perfect, and further cements them to lives of, of inequality, cements them to lives of inequality. So you've got perfect and, and cementing in, in that sentence. Say, say more about that. Right. I mean, it, it, you know, a scholar of stratification, we're interested in the different types of mechanisms, institutions, or practices that sort of changes the life course for certain individuals. And our criminal legal system is clearly that that it over surveils in commun poor communities and, and communities of color to the point where some scholars now have found that um, young black men have a likelihood of incarceration more so than employment or participation in, in the military forces. Um, and you know, you mentioned the, the research by my colleagues, uh, Frank Edwards and Mike Esposito and Hetty Lee that found that the leading cause of death for young black men is being killed by the police. One in 1,000 lifetime likelihood risk for black men to be killed by the police. Um, and so this is a system that perfectly targets, right? Uh, particularly black men in this society, but also poor people in this society, marks them with a felony conviction debt um, and it it keeps them marginalized for the rest of their lives. You know, my, book, my book is titled A Pound of Flesh monetary sanctions as a punishment for the poor. I wanted it to be a, as a permanent punishment for the poor, but my editor thought there were too many words. Um, but that's what it is. This becomes a permanent punishment for some people. Again, if you're wealthy, in many instances, even with a conviction and incarceration, you can move forward in your life. But if you're not wealthy, um, you don't have that opportunity to get out from under the knee of the criminal legal system. Something that you do in your work, and I know this of you, Dr. Harris, is that you, um, you're, you're a scholar and you can be a national world-class scholar and actually not engage in the community at all and still end, end your career having, having been known as, as an incredible scholar. But that's not how you, that's not how you roll. <laughs> so you spend your time, and this is where public scholarship comes in. This is one of the reasons I invited you to be a part of this course. Um, because of the work that you do that, that is oftentimes unseen. You take books like Pound of Flesh, you take your work and your scholarship and you take your teaching and you take yourself out in the public and you talk to policymakers, you make your way to the White House, you talk to legislators at all levels of the system, you talk to legal, legal educators, you talk to judges, 
you talk to community members, you talk to citizens, and it gives us a sense that there are things that we can that we can do because you're doing them. Talk about some of the things that that give you hope. Mm. I think one of the big things for me is that um, I've always thought that education is key. That people, some of it's naive. That people, I think, well, people just don't know uh, the inequality that exists. And so, you know, my role is to help educate them. Um, but I think it's also being having access to real data and giving practitioners those data to see where the problems are. And so that's when I have opportunities to engage, I do that. And I work with my graduate students and, and, and try and support them to do that as well. So literally today, this morning, I spent my morning crunching numbers with one of my uh, amazing graduate students for uh, local judges who are interested in one particular question related to monetary sanctions. And so I think helping people answer questions. So part of that's building relationships with folks locally and nationally um, to when they have questions, they can come to me and I can help get them the data. Um, but that, so that's what gives me hope is that so many people have these questions. And um, I run my mouth a lot and talk about my work in different spaces. And I think that raises awareness as well, which I think is important. And then folks can come to me and ask questions. But I see the hope. I was in a conversation a couple of weeks ago with um, one of our representatives, the House of Representatives, a member of the House of Representatives in the U.S. Um, in, in D.C., um, I've been in conversations with locals, you know, city councils, did a presentation, um, and people want it, want change. Just, I think within the context of this, this historical moment, people are asking questions. And so that's hopeful for me. I think now it's a matter of how do we translate that to leading to real change? Because the power is really, I think, a large part of the powers in our, our state um, House of Representatives um, and uh and, and, and also the federal uh, Congress. Um, but we really need to focus on our, our state legislators to change the policies that we have that affect us locally here. But I, 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 still, I still have hope. I did a talk, I moderated a talk last week with um, a national scholar and I asked her this question. I said, how do you keep on moving on when you see these patterns throughout history? She's a historian. And she said, I stand on strong shoulders. And I think that resonated with me because I, whoever we are, it doesn't matter who you are, somewhere in your lineage, somewhere in your ancestry, you, someone had to fight for you to be where you're at today and have that privilege that you have today. So we stand on strong shoulders and we have to be that next generation of strong shoulders. Um, so I think that's where my hope comes from is, is what I owe to my ancestors for getting me to this point in my life. Beautifully said. I'm, I'm recalling a conversation I had with a colleague in Spokane, Washington, I believe it was last year, and I called and asked how he was doing. And he said, much better because Alexis Harris was here. Oh. And in some ways I think about 2020, that this year was better because you were here, Alexis. Wow. Thank you for all your good work. Thank you, Ed, I appreciate that. 